conceptual, but to actually put a little quantitative heft behind them. Um, I don't have too much to say about this, but this is a new organizing principle that's been thrown into the mix by the Eisenberg group at UCLA. Uh, what they did was they synthesized lots of small fragments from am amyloidogenic proteins. And you can read it, for example, you'll find the, um, let's see, I can't read it up there, but there's sequences from the yeast prions there, there's sequences from the A-beta peptide involved in Alzheimer's. There's quite a few uh, different short sequences here. And then he threw them together in a test tube and he watched them aggregate. And he discovered that many of them aggregate according to these steric zipper rules. And these steric zippers, um, the idea here is that you get a nice fit, a nice interdigitation between the residue, the side chains of the residues. Uh, and you can, if you think about how to put those together, you have the choice of using parallel beta sheets, using anti-parallel beta sheets, and then you have the choice about how you line up the beta sheets with respect to one another. So for example, in this case, which he calls up-up, you have the same orientation to the beta sheets, but uh, let's see, yeah, and you go face to face. So in a way, you sort of wrap, if you had a loop, you'd sort of wrap one beta sheet around the other. And so you can see how he's counting the residues here. But you could flip, the, you could flip it over, and then the arrows for the purple beta sheet point the same direction as the arrows for the gray beta sheet. And then you need to digitate these residues over here. Uh, this one is called up-down. You take this beta sheet and you basically flip it over vertically, and then you can interdigitate the residues. And then this would be the face-to-face -face version of that, and this would be the face-to-back version of that. And you can do the same thing for anti-parallel beta sheets. And he's actually observed uh, in his uh, uh, experiments, he's actually observed these and these. He has not yet observed these or these. He has also observed these in his experiments. So eight different kinds of uh, aggregates you can get out. It's very interesting principle. You get beta sheet formation, and you get the steric zipper at about the same time. It sort of isn't clear which comes first. And as Jose was stressing, those interaction strengths are all about the same for, for binding these things together. But, um, but it is another kind of organizing principle for, for building up amyloid fibrils. Uh, in some sense, for linking fibrils together, because each beta, uh, each, each beta slab is, in some sense, the element of a fibril, and you're sort of linking those fibrils together through the steric zipper. The one criticism that's been made of this is that he's only looked at small peptides. And if you look at full-length peptides that are relevant biologically, it's not at all clear you'll see the same kind of steric zipper uh, formation. But it's, it's, it's an interesting idea, and it's new, as you can see. Uh, it just came out last year. And finally, another organizing principle is to look for the amyloid structure from already existing monomeric motifs. The domain swapping actually, if you go back, that provides an example of it because you, you have beta sheet motifs in those SH3 domains, for example. But one thing that we've been particularly fascinated with, and I'll tell you more why we're fascinated with it in a minute, are these beta helical structures. Um, these beta, my group can probably tune out and go to sleep right now because we talk about them all the time. But these beta helical structures uh, can be left-handed or right-handed. The left-handed are particularly beautiful. The right-handed are not as beautiful. But the left-handed have these triangular cross-sections. They've been observed in uh, some bacterial enzymes where they inevitably form trimers. And they've been observed in some insect antifreeze proteins. Um, and uh, they have 18 amino acids per repeat unit in an ideal uh, beta helix. And there's about uh, four uh, residues per beta strand on each side of the triangle right here. And the point is, as many people have noticed, is you can just take these beta helices and stack them up to form filaments of fibrils, where you get edge-to-edge -edge beta sheet um, uh, connection. OK, so uh, now I'll talk about another use of theory uh, by the, um, this is by a group in Germany. Uh, theory is a probe of possible sub Subobservable structure. You, let's, let's go back to this issue of polyglutamine diseases. You remember when I was talking about Huntington's diseases, that for Huntington's disease, the observation of the disease popped into the human lifespan at about 40 repeats, 40 poly, 40 cues linked together. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that the critical number is somewhere in that ballpark of say 36 to 40. Now why do I bring up 36? Uh, it's one of those magic numbers. It's not as good as 42 for fans of Hitchhiker's Guide, but 36 is a magic number. Uh, 36 is the first uh, place where you can get complete closure with all the internal hydrogen bonds satisfied of a beta helix. You have two layers of the beta helix. That's 18 residues per turn. You can get all of those internal hydrogen bonds satisfied at 36. 
And as I mentioned, one interesting thing about PolyQ is that these aggregation studies suggest a critical nucleus of one. So you can actually uh, maybe infer the start of the Huntington's fibrils from a critical nucleus, which is a monomer. Um, and so one question is, is the minimal stable PolyQ a left-handed beta helix? There's a lot of, uh, there's no uh, proof one way or the other, but there's a lot of discussion about this. These are some experiments on test tube growth of PolyQ from the Vonker lab uh, in Germany. Uh, these are the number of residues per the peptide that they grew. And notice that there's a sharp break here. Uh, let's see if I can read it off here. The one uh, with the square is 32 amino acids. And then you have this sharp break in fluorescence from amyloid staining dye. You have this sharp break at 37. So there's something happening here between 32 and 37. There's no proof yet that the beta helix applies to any one of these amyloid diseases but it remains an intriguing possibility, particularly for the PolyQ. Now, what the group um, in Germany set out to do, this is work by Stork and collaborators, published in Biophysical Journal in 2005. What they set out to do is they said, well, look, um, we're not going to watch uh, a random PolyQ, well, we're not going to, it's not random, we're not going to watch a PolyQ um, peptide fold, and as we've discussed, that's not easy to do. But what we can do is we can try to put it in a beta helical structure and see if it hangs together. And so this is a, an, an honorable simulation tool. You try to guess the structure and see if it, if it holds together with time. So these are simulations uh, using the CHARM molecular dynamics program, where you treat the uh, interactions between the, the, all the atoms as classical forces, and the atoms are, are little balls with charge on them. Um, this is for a two-turn beta helix, and that didn't look so good, unfortunately. It doesn't mean necessarily that you can't find a two-turn beta helix in nature. But it does mean, at least within the charm, that that's not stable enough to hang together on nanosecond simulation times. Uh, the, the top layer doesn't do too bad, but the bottom layer comes undone. This is the RMS deviation from your starting structure, and this is the time in nanoseconds. Um, a three-turn beta helical structure does pretty well. So here is the first coil, the second coil is four turn, and the third coil. This is the RMS deviation. You're down in the level of about one to two angstroms RMS deviation, which is pretty typical if you just took a protein off the PDB that we know to be stable and you simulate it with one of these programs, you're going to find an RMS deviation, something like that, just putting it on uh, to, to charm or amber. And notice that it's basically pretty flat with time out to 10 nanoseconds. It doesn't prove that it's stable, but it gives a strong hint that this is a pretty, pretty good structure. OK. So. Um, at least there's evidence that you can produce a critical nucleus of three turns of the beta helix from uh, computer simulation. It's harder to form two turns, but the experimental evidence certainly makes one want to look harder at this question. And I think it's an open question, so anybody who might get inspired by, by this, uh, you're welcome to give it a shot. Now, um, one of the things that I've already mentioned is that um, it's pretty clear that, that um, for example, in the case of the prions, um, there are these little oligomers. I showed you these two-dimensional crystals of these oligomers. And it's pretty clear in all of these diseases that these oligomers form. Oligomers are just um, multimers, dimers, trimers, etc., of, of, of the relevant protein. And um, those oligomers are probably what's doing the damage on the disease. Fibrils, for example, are not perfectly correlated with disease. Many people die with plaques from Alzheimer's disease, but have never shown symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. That is, they have the amyloid plaques in their brain. And some of the human prion diseases, or some of the mammalian prion diseases, when you look at the brains of the deceased individuals, um, they, they show the same deterioration of the brain without showing plaques. Okay? So what's killing off the nerve cells may not be the plaques with the big fibrils. Those are the easiest things to study. It made sense to study those first. You get lots of it, you can study it, but that may not be what's actually killing things. And it's also clear, for example, in the case of the uh, diseases which happen within the cell, like Huntington's disease, that the cell actually collects the stuff into something called an agrosome. And if you get the stuff collected in the agrosome, as, as, as long as there's not too much of it, you're probably going to be OK. Um, so there's a thought that when you get the fibrils, you're actually protecting the cells. You're either putting them away from the cells so that until you collect too much stuff, it doesn't really damage the cells. Or within the cell, you're pushing it into these agrosomes so it doesn't do damage either. So then the question becomes, if, if, it, is, if, if it is these oligomers, what are some uh, organizing principles for how you can uh, wind up killing the cells? Um, one very intriguing idea 
which is very highly cited, is this paper by uh, Ron Capito and collaborators in science uh, seven years ago. Uh, and the idea is that it shuts down one particular degradation pathway inside the cell. And you can understand it from a picture. So this degradation pathway is called the, um, the ubiquitin pro proteasome uh, degradation, degradation pathway. And so what happens is, if a protein has been a bad guy, so you have a protein which is uh, misfolded, what this thing will do is it will dress it up with ubiquitin protein. Once it's dressed up with ubiquitin protein, it's transported over. I'm, I'm drawing this all schematically. I don't really know for sure what a proteasome looks like. But it goes over to what I call the protein garbage disposal, the proteasome. And it's fed into the proteasome, this protein. And then you get amino acids out the other end of the proteasome. So it's a way for the cell to clear away stuff that went wrong. It clears away misfolded proteins. Uh, now, here's the problem that Capito pointed out. Suppose that you get a large aggregate, say, of, of poly Q inside the cell. And you dress it up with ubiquitin. And the ubiquitin tries to take it over the proteome. It's too big. It clogs up the garbage disposal. You can't fit it in there. Moreover, you keep drawing more ubiquitin over it to try to take care of it. So you're basically pulling away ubiquitin from other things. You're clogging up the garbage disposal. And eventually, you can maybe kill the cell that way, because you're shutting down function. Um, and he has evidence of that. I'm not going to go into this in any more detail, but he does have evidence uh, that uh, uh, in cells where you have um, operating agrosomes, operating uh, uh, regions where the the um, the bad the, the the aggregates are taken, then this uh, proteasome shutdown doesn't happen. But in cells where you take away the agrosome, then the proteasome shutdown happens. Yes, that's down here. Okay. So this is one idea of, of how you can have an organizing principle for toxicity based on the observation of, of oligomers. Now here's another idea which has gotten an enormous amount of study. You can form pores from oligomers. The idea is that, that you can make oligomers into a ring-shaped structure that they can sit inside of a membrane and let things through that shouldn't get through, like excess calcium, for example. And I included three papers in the, uh, the packet over here that discuss this possibility. Um, and here's some examples of how these pores have been formed for the uh, A-beta peptide involved in Alzheimer's disease. These are electron microscope images from, uh, from Halal Lashual. Halal has also done it with one of the mutations that leads to the familiar form of uh, Lou Gehrig disease, the disease that also Stephen Hawking has. Uh, this is alpha synuclein involved in Alzheimer's. This is um, also, uh, let's see, this is a different amyloid disease here. These are some AFM images from Ratnesh Lau's group of the A-beta peptide. These are some AFM images on supported bilayers, supported lipid bilayers of the alpha synuclein peptide. And the idea is that um, you can get this oligomerization process, which can then either go towards fibrils, or you can perhaps form oligomers, which are either on the pathway or off the pathway, that they can then provide this core structure right here. And the idea actually is, is a little bit old. It was introduced by... Um, it's been studied a lot recently, but it was introduced by hmm, it was introduced by Nelson Arispe and collaborators in the early 90s. This is the sequence of the A-beta peptide, and they actually constructed, without much data to go on, they constructed a really beautiful model of how you could make a, a pore, a two-sided pore. You have a pore that sits in the upper leaflet of the membrane, a pore that sits in the lower leaflet of the membrane, has some alpha helical content, and it has some uh, beta barrel content, uh, and that you can actually let calcium ions come through that pore. Uh, so you need two helices basically to, to, to come together, two of these pores to come together to puncture the membrane completely. Um, and this is from a paper they wrote in 1994. Uh, now, uh, a more recent development, and in some ways uh, more grounded in the data, is um, to make pores out of this structure. Uh, this is from Reef's lab at the Salk Institute in San Diego. They did solid state NMR of A-beta fibrils, and they have this very interesting sort of horseshoe structure um, where, let's see, you, you go uh, wrap around this way, and there's beta, long beta strands on either side, and then there's a salt bridge between a lysine and a um, aspartic acid right inside the, uh, 
right inside the, this, this beta structure. Now these can separately pack into to fibrils uh, with you know, more than one of these filaments, one, more than one of these beta filaments, and it may well be that the steric zipper ideas apply to the packing together of those. But one thing you can do with these is you can bend them around and form a torus. You can bend them around and form a ring. And the length of these beta strands is such that, that you can puncture that ring completely through a cell membrane. And Ruth Nusenoff's group looked at that and simulated it uh, again. Again, the idea was make stable structures and simulate it. They did it in two different ways. They said, look, we can curve it this way, in which case we would have these um, green hydrophobic regions exposed to the membrane. Or we can curve it this way, in which case we have these red charged regions uh, exposed to the membrane. Not surprisingly, you might guess this one is better, although uh, when she does the simulations on nanoseconds time scales, uh, there's not too much difference. So here, the, these are not showing the, the lipids, but she's actually embedded these all the way through a, a simulated lipid bilayer. And then she watches with time to see if these rings hold together. And these are these two different structures here that I was talking about. Um, and uh, they do more or less hold together on the time scale of, say, 20 to 30 nanoseconds. But you can see that quite a bit of, of, of disorder is showing up in the, in the annulus. One has to just regard this as a, a preliminary effort to investigate this question. She's also made double tori, uh, sort of tori on the inside and tori on the outside, to, uh, to go after this as well. Uh, as I recall, those are a little more stable, but I don't think she's published that data yet. But it's the same idea as I mentioned for the poly Q. You guess a structure, and then in, you check to see how stable it is. And then you try to do further things to check if there are, you try to make that, that structure, try to produce falsifiable tests out of the proposed structure. OK. Uh, you know, I think I maybe, this is some work that we did. Um, I'm deciding whether I maybe want to skip this and move on. Uh, I think I'm going to skip through this. Uh, this was some work we did on A beta, but I think I'm going to skip through this and move on. Um, and talk about prions some more. OK. So um, I want to come back now and discuss um, something which ties together domain swapping and ties together these beautiful monomeric beta helix structures. Um, and, and that requires me to talk about the prion again. So again, this is I showed you this yesterday. This is the structure of the normal cellular form of the prion. Um, I think I mentioned it's about 90 to 95% the same in all mammals. Um, in fact, some form of the prion protein seems to be present in all vertebrates. Whatever it does is basically an ancient protein. Um, and it, it binds copper in divalent form. There's five sites in humans and mice, and there's six in cattle. Um, OK. And then this is that two-dimensional crystal I showed you. And based upon some very lovely uh, analysis of this two-dimensional crystal using signal processing and using two different kinds of staining techniques, the UC San Francisco group from Fred Cohen's lab and from Stanley Kruzner's lab proposed that the model for these little donut-shaped oligomers was a trimer of these beta helices. A little bit more about that. It's a model. It's uh, the model, the, the resolution of the model is below the resolution available in the experiment. But here's what motivated it. For one thing, this is one of those bacterial enzymes I talked about before. You can take that bacterial enzyme and on top of this signal average, average data, where you can see this, this uh, symmetry of red patches. I can explain to you what that is experimentally if you're interested afterwards. But you can see this, this threefold symmetry of the red patches here. You can take this bacterial trimer and plop it right on top of that. Um, so they made a trimer of beta helices. They took the alpha helices that were left over and stuck them on the outside. The reason they did that is because the sugars that are known to bind to the prion protein attach here. And they used a separate staining technique with gold nanoparticles that preferentially attaches to sugars, and notice that they got these patches for the sugars on the outside of their, of their signal. Now, this was when I was on sabbatical, and Si Chen Yang, the same Si Chen who I mentioned on those two domain swapping papers, um, with Herb and Jose and I started talking about this. And one of the problems is that there's glue in this bacterial trimer that holds it together. There are zinc ions that covalently bond between these monomers that hold it together. But as far as we could see, there was no glue in this proposed model, as beautiful as it is. We wanted to see if we could rescue that some way. And basically, C. Chen suggested, why don't we try domain swapping? So we basically took the beta helices from the UCSF model. We took the top layer of each beta helix, analogous to that domain swapping in the SH3, and we just swung it around cyclically like that. And that provides the glue. And we found that uh, when we simulated that with all atom uh, molecular dynamics using amber um, out to one nanosecond, not only did we find that that held together 
unlike this one, but we found that there was increased hydrogen bonding to stabilize it in the core region. And uh, you get a little bit of energy gain because these yellow regions have prolines in them. By making them straight instead of bent like that, you gain a little bit of, uh, you, you relax the elastic energy of those loops just a little bit, but that's not a large effect. Um, and this also gives an idea about this, a uh, potential idea about this principle of strains in the prion disease. If the strains were encoded, for example, in the number of monomers in such a domain swapped uh, oligomer, then you would imagine that it's possible to form, say, trimers and tetramers. Uh, well, the trimers, if they grew out in the aerial aggregation that I talked about before, those trimers would fit together differently than tetramers, so you wouldn't be able to grow trimers off of tetramers or vice versa. It also turns out that the neuronal surfaces are close enough that you can kind of have an epitaxy, where you would take a trimer on one neuron surface, grow a trimer on another surface, but clearly you couldn't have a trimer grow a tetramer. So in other words, if the strain was encoded in the conformation of the oligomer, you have a chance to understand how the, how the strains could breed through. And I think I'll move on from there. Um, I'm going to show you just a couple more things um, here right now, and then I'll, I'll open it up for some discussion. So this is some more recent work that we've submitted to, uh, to JMB um, based upon some uh, data from the College and Sable groups that appeared in JMB in, in 2006. Take a look at this. This is experimental data, or uh, interpreted from experimental data on electron diffraction. This is a um, prion fibril. It's very different than the Alzheimer's fibril. It's 30 angstrom resolution, so it's not as highly resolved as the Alzheimer's fibril. But it's very different than a lot of the fibrils that have been found. This was grown in a test tube. And uh, the electron diffraction at 30 angstrom resolution gave you an electron density plot that looks like this right here. You got these thick regions, you got these holes, and by looking at the diffraction um, pattern in the way that, uh, for example, we talked about with those eight different amyloid diseases yesterday, one infers that there's cross beta structure on each side. There's cross beta structure with a 4.8 angstrom repeat unit. So there's something hooking up the two sides. There's cross beta structure. And they already made a suggestion, maybe this is a, a tetramer, maybe a, a repeat unit of a tetramer. And we thought, well, how could we do something like that? Um, well, we took the, the prion protein here. We knew that in this region, there were some possible beta helix models that were already proposed by the Prusner group. So we decided, let's take beta helix models from this region right here. That's what they call the end beta helix over on this side. Let's take a beta helix from the alpha helices over here. Because the other point about the Sable data is that the alpha helices are all wiped out as inferred by glycosin data. There's a disulfide bridge between these two alpha helices right there. And the only way to fit that on a beta helix is to put it on a corner. Once you do that, uh, anybody can basically get a, a, a working structure of a beta helix. And now these are our tinker toys for building up a model structure for this. Uh, and uh, there's basically eight different structures you can build. But to try to fit the experimental data, only these three work in terms of uh, giving you the stuff in between that could correspond to the electron density going across right here. And in fact, we took this one and we could basically fit it right inside of the, the, the data from Sable's uh, group. Um, OK. So the point is, uh, what are we doing here? We're doing domain swapping. We're doing domain swapping now with these big, long loops. We're doing domain swapping between these monomers. They're all color coded. So this green nitrogen here hooks up to this green carbon here. The arrow indicates the sense of going from N terminus to C terminus. Each one of these little squares represents one of these two beta helices. Uh, and similarly, the blue here hooks up by, uh, over here with a C. So we're doing domain swapping between these, uh, these different units in order to, to build up a, a tetramer. And in addition, we believe that the same domain swapping that we talked about uh, with Sichun uh, Jose and Herb, that same domain swapping can be responsible for hooking the tetramers together basically on, on these N-terminal um, beta helices to, to build the whole fibril structure. So um, I think that these organizing principles are very beautiful uh, and they may give some insight into the disease, um, the organizing principles for the disease. I'm going to stop here today and I'll tell you about the third organizing principle for toxicity tomorrow. And I'll also go into some more general discussion of protein-protein um, interactions and things tomorrow. 
Uh, but now I guess I will stop and see if maybe you have any questions. Oh, wait, let's see. Do I have, am I on? Yes, that's right. It's been about an hour. Right. <laughs> right. So let's see. What, are, what questions might you have today? Or I'll put it to you again. What do you, this is a good technique for, for teachers. I, I read about it once. This guy from Virginia, he's a history professor. At the end of each class, he'd say, what did you least understand about the class today? And then he can tailor his, his next lesson you know, to respond to that. I, I started doing that when I was a professor at Ohio State. And I, I had a top 10 list of answers. And the very best answer was uh, the student said, what I least understood was the dream I had when I fell asleep and turned to class. <laughs> anyway, it was good. Uh, so what, what did you, what did you, now uh, you don't have to answer that today, but what, what did you least understand uh, from today's lecture, or what, what would you like to ask me? Yeah. I had a question about the four sciences. Yeah. It wasn't that, it wasn't the of the Yeah, so sorry, for the beta helical structure, it's 36. And you can't, that can't be a pore. You can't fit anything through the center of that beta helix. Yeah, so the pore, for example, yeah, so let me go back to this one. Uh, let me go back to the pores here. Actually, it'd probably be quicker if I do this. Let's see. Uh, go by time. Let's see. Pore formation. Um, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the data, for example, uh, if you look at more detail at this data, the inner diameter on all these pores is about two nanometers uh, at, at the opening of the pore. It may get narrower inside the pore. Okay? But the inner diameter of those pores is about two nanometers. And um, actually, in Nusinov's uh, work, it's, it's uh, I, don't, I don't recall. This is a tighter pore diameter here. I don't recall what the dimensions are on this model. Um, but if you look at Nusinov's work, she's tried to get these to have the same kind of 2 nanometer scale for the pore. And how big is the pore size? So 2 nanometer is the average size. How big is it get? Oh, the biggest pore size. Oh, gosh. Some of the pores that they've made synthetically here are much bigger. Some of these pores from, uh, from Hilal Lashwell and Peter Lansbury's work are much bigger. I forget, but they, you know, they could be much bigger internal diameters. It's not clear that all of these pores are relevant biologically. Some of these are really big chunks of protein. These, in retina Schlaw's experiments, for whatever reason, these are smaller chunks of protein. Yeah. Uh, okay, so sorry. I probably should have said something about the Alzheimer's, uh, about where the Alzheimer's sits. Okay, so Alzheimer's, basically, the A beta protein is, is secreted from the neurons. Then there are enzymes that come up and they clip off little chunks of A beta protein. You can get length 40 or 42. If you get 42, that seems to be worse for Alzheimer's. We all have some distribution of 40 and 42 inside our body. Now, the question is, do you either first inject those uh, A-beta peptides into the membrane? They will do that. Monomers inject in and they form little alpha helices. Or do you uh, form an aggregate outside? So if you inject them in, then you can form an aggregate right within the membrane. Or do you, in, do you form uh, aggregates outside that they can bend into a pore shape and inject into the membrane? Okay? Uh, that's not settled. There, there could be an advantage if you inject it into the membrane, because although the diffusion is much slower, you have a restricted search space to find each other. On the other hand, if you look at the cavities in between neurons, they're pretty tight, so the search space is already not so bad for those eight betas to get together. So uh, that's something that's not answered yet, whether you form the pores inside the membrane or whether you form the pores outside and stick them in, even in these biophysical experiments, that's not answered yet. Um, and then to the extent that this actually happens in vivo, of course, we have, we have no idea. I should have mentioned also, by the way, on uh, Ratnish Lal's group, besides looking at these supported bilayers, they've put uh, uh, oligomer-forming peptides in the presence of cultured neurons. And they've looked to see if the calcium content of the neurons increases, and it does. Uh, not surprisingly, well, zinc, they put in divalent zinc, which of course has the same charge as calcium, that blocks the pore. Now, zinc can covalently bond, so it may in fact, and there are histidines in, uh, in um, Alzheimer's peptide, so the zinc may in fact uh, bottle things up by covalently bonding the histidines, depending upon your model. Let's see, that's, that's what, did that answer your question? Okay, great. Uh, what are your other questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just. Yeah. That, uh, so when you just uh, the first part of the selection. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we didn't you, fall asleep like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than fall asleep. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, what, what are you least of your students was the email that you received. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to understand the paper he's refereeing while he's sitting there. Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Tristan. Uh, yeah. which, so back towards the beginning, you said? Yeah, just uh, just the way you, you model, for example, the, the medical disease. Well, uh, yes. the medical so, so somewhere back there. Yeah. Anyway, but then it, okay, then you have the distribution. Of your, yes. Yeah. So anyway, so there are uh, several uh, main experiments showing that if you take some of the, uh, so you take the spleen. Uh, so if, if you apparently there is a need for uh, during the incubation, so you, you need to pass through. Uh, yeah. Sure. Or, sure. So ha have you prayed with that? I mean, no. If no. There is a. For example, the, maybe there, there is a place where it has some uh, right. uh, parameters, and then there is a better right. one. Uh, here would be my answer to that. I, I'm pretty sure that if you looked at the, so if this is, remember that this peak is five years yeah. for the cattle. Uh -huh. So if you looked at the time it's spent in the peripheral organs, it'd be somewhere down in here, and it would not affect the position of that distribution too much. Um, the point is that once you, so if you're absolutely right. When you take it in, um, when you digest the stuff, uh, it has to first make it to your lymph system, basically by going through the Isle of Langerhans in your intestines. Um, then it can propagate in the lymph system, because it will also grow on the follicular dendritic cells. It doesn't kill them, but it will grow there. And you can find, as you said, significant quantities in the spleen, for example. But once you get it into the central nervous system, or sorry, once you get it on peripheral nerves, then it goes on fast axonal transport. So in no time at all, it can be moved right up to the central nervous system. So there could be a period of latency of, I think, weeks or so inside the lymph system, maybe months, but months on the time scale of yeah. five years. So there could be a, a latency of, of, of some weeks or a couple months in the, in the lymph system, and then it will make it to the central nervous system, and then you're in trouble. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Since I may go to the, to the other question. So uh, to make the beta helix, so have, have anyone done experiments with the, you, you have several mini prions and some uh, forms that, uh, I mean, for example, the mini prions they, that, I, that uh, Bruce and Richard made didn't have part of the end, right. most of the end right. vein. Right. And on that, there are right. some, uh, some uh, prion mutants that, don't, that you have a stop uh, right. uh, mutation, right. so it's right. at 45 something. I mean, how does it fit if you if you need, for example, the other part of the molecule? Right. Okay. So so uh, there's two two answers to that. On the stop codon, um, there has been uh, both. Uh, you know, there's unpublished NMR work uh, where they found evidence that with the stop codon at 145, so you cut out the C terminus altogether, with the stop codon at 145, that um, you get something that looks more like a beta slab. Okay. So that'd be more like something you see with the A beta set. Um, with the uh, mini prion, in fact, they used the mini prion in these experiments here. It turned out that the mini prion, uh, where you delete a region of about uh, what is it, 30 residues right in the middle of the prion, the mini prion and the full length prion get the same electron microscopy images right here. And that's what they used, in fact. They did um, negative staining uh, and then took the difference between the image for the mini prion and the full length, or the pair of 27 to 30. And they did the same thing with the gold. So then they could get uh, difference maps to where they bound on the two different structures, and then they could they could map out where those features were with higher resolution. So that that was used actually in this uh, electron microscopy study. So certainly the, the mini prime will give you the same structure of aggregates, but something different happens if you delete the C if you delete the C term in this term. Yeah. Uh, sure. The, the, this was the uh, the one the sort of prions on the nerve cell. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll back up to that here. Well, I think I you said that um, there was something else besides the increased surface area that caused the increased uh, acceleration. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of a hidden feature. It turns out that um, that in that particular model with the critical coordination three. Um, that to, to attach, you always have to have a, a, a point on the periphery where a dimer attaches. And the number of such points is linear in the number of dimers that attached before. So it actually is an example of one of these um, sort of branching models, only 
that was a one-dimensional context yesterday, but it's an example of one of these branching models. And so it had a sort of hidden exponential growth. It's much slower exponential growth than you would get from breaking and stuff, but it gives an acceleration after you've, uh, after you've grown a little bit that's above and beyond just the simple uh, sort of surface area acceleration. So it actually, one nice thing about that is when we apply, there, there's some detailed problems in trying to apply this more to analyzing some of the incubation time data or some of the dose incubation time data. We did that, that's in the paper by Cole Carney, which is in the packet over there. But, um, but one of the nice things about that was that because of there's, a, there's an acceleration, if you imagine that it takes a long time to get to size A, the time it takes to get from, to size, from size A over two to size A is much shorter. And what's observed is that the, um, the doubling times are very short in mammals, even if the incubation times can be somewhat long. Did we see that in the accumulation of the, the, the prions in the mice? Uh, there seem to be two phases. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So yeah, I, I used, there were two different things that I talked about there. Uh, so actually, let me try to go back to the prions in the mice. The prions in the mice uh, did not have um, exponential growth. They didn't have surface growth. Um, let's see. With the prions, the, these, you're talking about the transgenic mice, right? This one here. So here, because we deleted the membrane anchor, we can't get that two-dimensional aggregation that we talked about. But it, but apparently also, since we only get this t-squared behavior, we're simply getting linear elongation of the uh, of the uh, prion filaments outside of the cells. So somehow, I mean, I gave one argument that could give you potentially. Uh, uh, the incubation time distribution and putting that, putting that together with fish and say, give you the, uh, the overall uh, description of incubation in, in, in animals, but it required this membrane bound growth. If you take away the membrane, you just get this, this you get growth of infectious material, but it's just a simple elongation and it doesn't have any fission or breakage. No, no stupid questions here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the core formation, because I'm really intrigued by that. If we're not following a certain T-squared behavior, I'm trying to understand Oh, uh, the core formation. Um, well, the initial the initial aggregation could, could follow the T-squared. But, but then, you know, at later times, it has to somehow close off. Um, so it, I mean, it's just that if you drew a curve of the pores, initially they might show a T-squared law at short times. You see, I'm really interested in Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the, well, the experimental papers are in, in there. So take a look and see what they say about the, it's, it's pretty slow. But it's, it's, it's not, when you put enough concentration, it's not so bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, given that particular model where you just sort of wrap the fiber around, you could probably do you now a kinetic simulation of that where you were not, where you sort of coarse grain things. You weren't too molecularly explicit. And you could, you could try to do a kinetic simulation to see if it could, could fold around like that. Um, it would also, the ability to fold around would also depend upon the stiffness of the, uh, you know, the sort of, um, what's the, uh, you, you could try to estimate the, uh, what's that called? The, uh, it's like, uh, my mind is, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, I think it is all time. Yeah, right, you know. Yeah, anyway, you know, the, the, the bidding modulus of the, of the molecule, basically. Do you actually have strain on this thing? Do you actually have a, do you have a when you bend things, is it a net bending? Do you have to compensate for that? Or? Uh, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, there's definitely going to be some strain when you when you bend it like that. Are you sure? Is anyone has estimated how much you get? Or that's just basic. So you're telling me that is much larger than KT of that thing? Uh, that I don't know. That I don't know. I, I mean, I, I just I just thought about it right now. I, I, and, I, and certainly Ruth uh, Ruth Nusenoff didn't estimate that. The only thing I know is that people have done the tensile. Uh, they've, they've done tensile forces. Uh, this is Kate McPhee. She's done, in fact, she spoke about it at uh, the Los Angeles. She's done tensile uh, forces on, on uh, amyloids. Uh, but um, I don't think anybody's really done the bending forces. And for that model, it would be pretty interesting to know. Persistence length, good God. Uh, right. 
persistent cycle. It'd be very interesting to know. How big is the core base? How much is the uh, her core is she she built them to be about two nanometers inside. And you know, it's much bigger outside. Thing. It's, it's, it's a pretty soft bedding, right? For two nanometers inside. Yeah, no, no. Look take take a look at her picture. She had of the order of twenty peptides, I think. Let me go to Let's see, if you count, it's, well, it's a little hard to see here, but if you count, it looks like there's about 20 of those guys in there, so it's a pretty gentle. So what's the typical persistence lens for proteins? Five of the classes? What's the persistence, typical persistence lens in proteins? Five of the classes? Well, we know what it is for alpha helix. I don't know for, for beta. So what's for alpha helix? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know what it is for alpha helix. Alpha helix. Well, what's the persistence well, just the persistence length of an alpha helix, say, right? Um, it may it probably wouldn't be so much different for. Well, it could be quite a bit different actually for beta structure. I don't know. Uh, I'm guessing it'd be softer for beta structure. Three point four. Three point four. Well, that's just the binding thing, but the, but the persistence length once you try to bend the alpha helix. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For people do this sort of uh, worm-like model, they have the number of there. Yeah, yeah, you can take a look and see. At least that would be a, a first guess, uh, even if it's stiffer. Another question? Okay. Well, back to the beta helix. So, how is the accessible substance uh, taken care? And the reason I'm asking that is because there is. Uh, some discussion, I mean, uh, and I think Oki Kokshkinak, uh, they just presented some work last year of a uh, uh, solid state MR that uh, has a lot of evidence there is a lot of uh, protection on the solvent. And so, uh, as I will talk tomorrow, high pressure also shows in some case that that uh, there is uh, this uh, excessive surface area decrease, I mean, and then becomes pressure sensitive, and then sometimes becomes pressure sensitive, and we don't know what happens. Is too strong or maybe is hybrid. So when you model, when you get a beta helix, how is? Yeah. So um, the ideal beta helix, actually, um, I'll, I'll show you. Maybe I should just draw it here. Um, the ideal beta helix. strand is roughly two to, uh, 2 to 5 and 3 and 5 point in. And if you look, at, there's not very, it's not a big database. There's about 11 of these left-handed beta helices out there. If you look at the database, 3 and 5 are completely dominated by um, uh, hydrophobic residues on the database. And 5, the biggest one that shows up on 5 at about 50% is isoleucine from the, uh, from the database. Uh, so uh, you, you certainly, um, on the known beta helices, you certainly will, will, will bury the hydrophobic, tend to bury the hydrophobic residues. Uh, one of the problems actually, the, there's some additional problems with the, I mean, it's a beautiful model, but there's some additional problems just with the particular thread that they used in the Prusner model, because the particular thread that they used has on the middle layer uh, for the mini prion, for example, a lot of glycines and alanines, and that will not give you the, that will give you an open space inside the beta helix, and that's obviously Water. no good. Water could get right in there, and it, when you simulate it, it just it just falls apart. Um, so there's ways to thread that internal one better, and already we've come up with one or two just for playing around with it. But one of the other games is is threading. I mean, how do, how do you find a good match between sequence and a particular structure? And, and we're trying to for it's it's been done sort of for right-handed beta helices by. Beta wrap. If you look up beta wrap on Google, they've done it for right-handed beta helices, but there's nothing yet for left-handed beta helices, and, and we're working on that. Uh, let's see. It seems lunch is it 12 or, or 12? I'm a little confused. 12. Okay. Then, I'm, then I guess I'm right on time. Or actually, I'm a little early. Unless there's any other questions, but I won't. I won't torture you. Just don't have beef for lunch or anything. But um, I, I won't torture you. Actually. You know, when I was in Switzerland, and before I started working on biological physics, I was in Switzerland giving some lectures, and it was at the peak of the mad, the mad cow scare. And um, 
one, one day we go to the cafeteria, they're serving the vegetarian meal on one side and they're serving like a beef dish on the other side. And there were two or three people over on the beef side. But the good news is, you know, it, it, it has turned out that it, it's pretty hard to, to passage to people and it is a relatively low uh, level of public health threat. Uh, it's just a, kind of a fascinating intellectual problem. Um, okay, well with that thought, um, I guess we can break. What did you do, man? You didn't afford it. What's your party animal? Right? 
uh, you're gonna uh, you're, you're gonna have uh, the RNA being uh, shut down and turned on. Now, if you describe this with differential equations, you get something like this. And then it really depends on and then it depends on the um, on the degree of multimerization of of B. If you have uh, if you have just monomers, you're not going to see these oscillations. And if you have uh, if you have bigger uh, oligomers, then then you see these oscillations. Here, you just do these two examples of of monomers and an octomer, and you can see the oscillations here. Now, if you describe the same system with the stochastic methods, you, you get these noisy things over here. But then again, you get a uh, in this case, you get pretty much the same as a deterministic approach, but you would have them less. And your vertical x is what? The, the gene is on or off is what? This is or just a uh, vertical. This axis, right? Yeah. It's just, uh, it's just the concentration of these things uh, normalized to the maximum value. Yeah. And uh, whatever the initial condition is here. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's here. Okay. But then there's some cases that are the stochastic. It's not going to be just the same as the deterministic, like these, uh, like these cases over here. This case over here is just, uh, um, it's, it's just a case where a protein is produced at a constant average, uh, at a, a constant uh, rate, and is degraded at a constant rate. Like it's, uh, I think the synthesis rate in this case is 16. And uh, the degradation rate is one. So that average that, that uh, makes the steady state 16, um, 16 proteins. Then uh, you start with eight. Then what happens then? Sometimes it's important. Uh, sometimes it's important to consider when um, when a certain protein reaches a, a certain threshold. Right? Uh, say in this case. Uh, Say in this case, you're trying to see when it's going to reach the steady state of 16. You can see that, uh, in theory, the, if with the differential equation, with the deterministic approach, it's never <laughs> going to approach it. It's never going to get to 16, right? And even if you discretize, that's what the, uh, this is what the black line is, is the deterministic, it, without any of it. Then, if you just discretize the the, the concentration of the protein here, that's what this red, li uh, this red line is. You can see that it's only going to reach the steady state over here. Well, if you use uh, stochastic methods, this is just two independent runs of a simulation using the, using the stochastic approach. You can see that you can uh, reach the steady state way before or after. Uh, it didn't make a big difference, right? Uh, in this other case down here, we're considering just a, let's say, a gene that stimulates itself, and it needs its own protein to, uh, to self-stimulate. Yeah? So, um, what happens then if you have a, a what's the what's the deterministic solution for this? You're going to have two. You're going to have two solutions. One at the steady state. And then one unstable one at zero, and, and with any uh, with any value, with any initial value, uh, deterministically with any initial value, you're always gonna go to the to the steady state, right? And if you're at zero, you stay at zero. Uh, but what happens uh, with the stochastic? If you have a if you have a high number of proteins in your steady state. Sometimes the fluctuations are not going to get to zero. But if your number of proteins is small, sometimes the fluctuations are going to get to zero. And what happens when you get to zero? You just stay there. You kill the protein and you can't produce anymore. Right? So this is a this is a this is a, a good example in the case where you really need the stochastic description over there, where you get this extinction of the protein uh, when stochastic protein don't go to uh, and uh, we're gonna. This is gonna come back later on. Um, you can get a lot of uh, interesting effects with this uh, total extinction of proteins, and you get a lot 
in this, in this situation where you don't have any other set of drugs. That's a way to give you all calls, right? Huh? The same way it can kill you and also take you out of death, right? Oh, not in this case, because you need... Yeah. Basal yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is a... This is uh, some, something we saw yesterday, but it might be useful to just repeat it today. Um, this is all you would do with uh, the technistic approach. You just... Um, you just draw this, uh, this, uh, this differential equations over here with a base of that. This, this is a concentration of, of say, protein A. That's regulated by protein D. You just report you know what basal is. Basal means you have a gene that's normally activated by a protein. And that's when you produce lots of protein. Okay. And sometimes when the protein is not there, it's not activated. It still produces a little bit. That's what basal means. Okay. Okay. Say that a gene is regulated. Uh, the gene is regulated, say gene, the gene that produces protein A is regulated by protein B. You're going to have, um, so the, 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 the level of expression of protein A is going to depend on the concentration of protein B, right? So, uh, it depends if the protein B is an activator or, or, a, or a repressor, but you're always going to have a, what you call the basal level is the lowest level of, of expression that you're going to have. And then, and then um, when the gene is fully activated, you're going to get the circular fully activated level. So this, this, this uh, the basal level is, is the least that you're going to have. And, uh, and uh, alpha 1 here is going to be the, the fully activated uh, rate of expression. And then this fully activated rate of expression is going to be modulated by this uh, this hill function, which is uh, which is something like uh, something that goes from zero to one, right? But in this case, we're going to be plus alpha zero here, and we're going to go to alpha one. Uh, and uh, this is in the case of repression. This is the case of activation, and how sharp this transition is is going to depend on this uh, the, this hill coefficient over here, this exponent. And where this transition is going to happen is, uh, is, is, uh, is what this x over here is. Uh, oh yeah, here, here's a picture of this. This is a protein B regulating the gene that produces protein A. And this over here is just, uh, the degradation of the protein. Right? So lambda is the degradation, rate, and it's proportional to the concentration of the protein. So just to refresh people's memory, I know they have this x. So this x is the threshold concentration, right? Means concentration yes. below it, you're not activated, more, right? That's the main yes. point of the transition. Yes. So that's the threshold concentration. The N is not exactly, but it's close to the level of nuclearization, right? That's correct, yes. Uh, um, yeah, the N, and the, uh, it, it depends on the, the that's what we call cooperativity. Is, uh, is, um, say, for example, if you have a binding of monomers to the DNA, is that going to be one? If you have a binding of dimers, going to be an order of two. Um, the other kind of thing is so. just interesting to say that normally activation depends on the on the oligomer, but normally protein is only destroyed at the monomer level. Right? Normally the oligomer is protected. Yeah, there's a there's so a that's that's what makes there the is, there is the more complicated the there's more complicated binding scenarios. And one of them is when they have the diamonds being uh, more, more stable than the monomer. More stable than the one. Actually, we're not going to talk about that. But yeah, it can have more complicated situations. Um, so this is also from yesterday. Uh, this is a this is a system with two genes that repress each other. Um, and here are those equations, and so you write this. Uh, both of these equations for, for protein A and protein B. Protein A is regulated by protein B here, protein B is regulated by protein A. This is a repression over here. Um, and if you have binding monomers, the exponent over there is 1. Uh, and you only have one stable solution. We're going to see more about this, uh, this system later, but it's just a, 
Let's see if you guys remember what we talked about yesterday. So what's the Those lines over here are... H, F, and K, just so we get rid of what you... Oh, okay. Let's describe all the parameters just to check. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're the same thing. But this, uh, this H is a binding rate, this F is an unbinding rate. And these here, the one are the synthesis rates, and the bound state and the unbound state. It's good to do, particularly to change the and H went from alpha to G. Uh, so it's, uh, for, it's, it's this black thing where they're going to shift. But uh, these lines are the, uh, what are called no lines. It's where this is equal to zero. Yeah. And this intersections here are our fixed points. That's, uh, that's, our, that's the, the point in the where the system is stable, right? So in this case, it, if you plot the probability distribution of this, you know we're going to see one peak over here. And you see all the arrows point to this guy, to that point over here. The, uh, the, these arrows are the, the flow. Um, and if you have manual dimers, the little coefficient is going to be two over there. You have comparative binding. And then you can have this line intersect in two different, uh, two different points. And uh, then you have by stability. Okay? Uh, you can see that the arrows around here point to this guy, and the arrows around here point to that guy. By stable system. Um, okay, so uh, now, now we're going to do stochastic methods. Um, Usually, when, uh, when in this problem of, of gene regulation, what is a bi-stable system? Here means that the, if you fall, you have two set states, right? They depend on your yeah. initial conditions. You have a bifurcation in your solution, and you have two steady states. And noise can make the system jump from one steady state to the other. Well, actually, technically, you have two steady states. Right? You have two. You got full with your system is just hanging there. Then where it starts, you yeah. one of them will answer the and never leave. The steady state has two different solutions. So um, okay, so uh, usually in this uh, problems of gene regulation, you're, you have only one copy of the DNA, and usually you have a, a few tens or hundreds of copies of the regulatory proteins. So it's a uh, it's very discrete in in nature. So it's really interesting to uh, to uh, to define a problem with uh, with discrete variables for the for the number of proteins. So you use number of proteins instead of concentration because the fluctuations can be really important and a such small such a, a small number of components. So then what we're going to do from now on is uh, we're going to 